right. Well, um, nice to see you, Carrie. Well, yeah, good to see you too, David. I'm loving watching all your updates on your uh, on the builds you're doing. Thank you. I was. Yeah. Um, we have a mutual friend, um, Ryan O'Connell. Yeah, he's wonderful. Yeah, he is great. Um, I just think it's wonderful that he's gotten so many people to his platforms on on this topic. Yeah, absolutely. And the way, and the, the, the I guess the overused f term is the tone and tenor of what he's doing. I think is is right there. I mean, right. the educational component about something that is so complex, I think, is brilliant. And so I'm happy to mention him and how to ADU the Facebook page that is exceptional is something I, I try to promote as often as I can. Yeah, you know, we do too, because, you know, as we can talk about some more today, unfortunately, we are not the most affordable option path forward for ADUs. I think uh, we have a lot of value to add, but I think that's where how to ADU is so great. There's especially, you know, typically we're working with homeowners that are working with a general contractor and not kind of do it yourselfers. And there is a great way to save a lot of money and, and you know, save resources if you have the time and energy to do that. And I think that's one of the great things with How To ADU. I think they've got just a great shared experience and database of people so you can find your right team. Yeah, I, I enjoy the back and forth that some people do and all the, the new members who just ask that general question, where do I start? I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. Let me, and then I have that um, post that I put up every couple months. It's like, Here's where you can start from a detached ADU perspective. And one of those things we're going to talk about, I don't want to give too much away um, but I'll, so that we can get into that because I think we're going to use all of the 60 minutes that we have blocked out because with, I could do that with my questions alone to you. But I know <laughs> that we have some people that may have some others. So with, with that, up, let me just welcome everybody um, who's joining us from the you know, our social media promotion of this, or you're here from the How To ADU Facebook group, which is put on by Ryan O'Connell, which is a great thing. We will be kind of adhering to the the protocols, the practices that How To ADU has, which we're not gonna promote any of our companies. We really wanna get the information to you about um, the role of an architect and how that works with your projects and and you'll hear me say that I, I really do promote working with the A team um, and advocate that if you are, you know, and there's, we're gonna dive into that a little bit more. For those of you um, who are watching this and it's a recording, thank you for being here. We're, and we hope that you get something out of this. Um, for those of you who are joining us live, if you would please put your questions in the, the q and I'll be trying to monitor the chat just in case they pop in there. And we will put this recording onto the um, Facebook group and then also on my social media platforms, the, the website and the YouTube channels. With that, welcome Carrie Shores Diller. Thanks so much. Um, you have a beautiful presentation. I've seen it and I want to kind of turn it over to you to kind of take us through some of the things that uh, we're going to be talking about. Great. Um, you know, I think one of the kind of, I think how I was approached is kind of giving some education around why you might want to work with an architect. Um, you know, in full transparency, do you need an architect, a licensed architect to be, uh, to design an ADU? You do not by state law. You can definitely work with a designer, an engineer. Um, there's a lot of different paths forward, but Architects have um, a lot of education, a lot of state licensing, and a lot of experience with design, which hopefully uh, you will see adds, um, adds value. Um, I don't know if this is true of all architects, but kind of our mentality to helping clients, especially with ADUs, is that um, what we do is we help you visualize. So this is a backyard uh, in Oakland, and this is an ADU that we put into it. Um, the Eileen. And so a lot of people look at this backyard and they have nowhere to, no idea how to start. So what architects typically do is they're going to start from an analysis of your site, um, what your, you know, what views are important, what the daylight is doing, what it's telling you, um, the access, the privacy, 
it's hard to tell because it, this is a little bit of a switcheroo, but the main house uh, is back here. So right now uh, the picture on the left is from the main house looking back. And then um, in this one, they wanted, the clients wanted to potentially rent out the unit until they were ready to downsize and move into it. They had some health issues um, and they're okay now, but they're not going to necessarily get better. So with this, we turned this L-shaped ADU away from the main house to give privacy to whoever was in it. So if it was a renter or the, the owners of the property could eventually move back here. And one thing you can ask your architectural team is kind of, you know, how much you want to do kind of small, medium, full service. And hopefully you can find a team that will, you know, give you a menu of choices based on, on what you need. But typically we start with analyzing the site, asking you about your goals. This is an exercise we do called a site assessment where we take some of our existing plans and, and look at how they might work in your yard. So this is an existing house and deck, um, a two car garage, and the clients wanted to see what's the possibility of adding an ADU and what's the possibility of adding a sport court. They were a very active family um, and they also wanted to expand the deck. So typically architects are gonna start at the site level. Um, they're gonna look at um, you know, how much space we have, what, is, what are the setbacks from a, a secondary structure, a main house, um, what's the opportunity to, in this concept over here, we actually connected the deck and the ADU. So it was more of a common shared place. Um, so we start here and then we overlay building code, uh, zoning and planning. So, and fire. Fire is the often overlooked code when it comes to ADUs. You know, with the, all the new wonderful ADU laws, um, the planning approval has gotten very streamlined and simplified. Building departments have typically come around, but fire is still kind of holding out uh, on some, uh, some pieces of code they feel like are very important for life safety. And sometimes that can, can, um, cause some challenges with uh, the process. The next thing, like once we get a floor plan going, we figure out what the size and shape is the right size in your backyard, making sure we're thinking about your privacy and how you're gonna connect with the ADU or be separate from it. When we get into visualizing the building. So the floor plan is typically where architects start and then they will um, fold it up and start to look at massing. So these are four different views of the same plan, um, looking at how we might need to be uh, contextual and compatible with the main house. Um, so looking at things that like how big it feels, you can see with these two different roof lines, like this lower one from this view feels bigger where this upper view feels like it's a, a little less, you know, massive. And so maybe that'll feel better when you're looking at it from the main house. But looking at all those pieces of kind of context, what materials are you going to want, where the windows and doors are, connection to the outside and the roof line. And then as we evolve, we get into the real technical parts of it. So typically the architects will coordinate all your engineering. So we all need Title 24 energy code for our ADUs. We all need structural engineering. You can do that, uh, what they call as a pers prescriptive method where you just follow the building code and you don't use the actual engineer. A lot of cities are requiring civil engineering or geotechnical reports based on whether you're near a fault line and some other things, which I hate to see because there's already an existing house there. You know what the foundation right. of that house is. Why are we making our homeowners invest $6,000? Yeah, you're talking about report? a sales report too, right? That's right. That's right. Um, but alas, that's where we are with things right now. So typically your architecture team is going to coordinate everything. They're going to coordinate with the building department, coordinate the submittal, they coordinate with the consultants, and then they create a set of drawings, technical drawings that are used for both permit and for the construction. And one of the things, Carrie, that I think that um, you kind of what we're talking about a moment ago where you talked about the mass for that one slide before this you're trying to put the the client into that space you're trying to visualize okay here you are if you have i mean i did a uh, a quick progress video me lamenting about the fact that i'm going to be losing my windows i mean losing the view from my window of the mountains right and you know we went with a 
pre-designed floor plan that did not have any of these options to be able to consider that. Right. You, an architect is gonna be able to go, hey, if, the, if your client wanted to, you have a beautiful view of these mountains from the back. Let's try to make sure that we bring that in. Right. Well, even if you look at this example, like these clients had this beautiful big redwood tree in the back corner here, and they kind of wanted when they were out in the yard to be able to see that. And so when we were laying out floor plans for them, you know, um, this is with some of our pre-designed plans, you can see like this ADU becomes an extension of the deck. So it's very much about connection and not privacy, but it keeps this view and access to this corner of the yard that they really liked that had great sun. Um, you know, I mean, often a lot of our really initial calls are, you know, what do you like doing in your yard? Where do you, do you like to get up in the morning and drink coffee in the sun? Do you like to go out, you know, and have a cocktail in the afternoon in the sun? You know, like, what's your favorite part of the day? Like, what are you worried about losing? And, you know, it's like you mentioned the view of the mountains. So then what can we do with the building um, and how we site it and the shape and form of it to kind of preserve those things that you already love? I mean, we've literally been out with, um, you know, sticks and flags standing out yes. on a, a client site and then they're on the balcony up above in their master bedroom and then we're raising and lower you know can you still see the view is it did we just block it and so um you know i think those kind of looking at those things and decisions before you're in construction um, are a really valuable thing i think that that kind of those set of questions asking the right questions and also um kind of iterating and looking at different possibilities on paper or in 3D modeling or in the yard before construction starts is super valuable uh, because right. let's say you don't do that and then the contractor raises the wall and you're like okay that's not going to work and then you want to rip that all out like people think architecture is expensive but um, I think we we do really help with a lot of those decisions so that during construction you're really running smoothly and you're really you know, you're not going to need to make expensive mistakes or, or changes in the field because those field, those field changes can you need revisions. They can, you know, you're losing time, you're losing money. So they have a lot of uh, implications. Well, I think it's also, yeah, it's, I think that the, the part that I'm really happy that we're sharing is the, there are very critical components that an architect, um, an architectural firm is going to take into consideration. Um, that's one thing, but then that coordination that you just mentioned that we've mentioned, I think is also something that if you haven't gone through a construction process, you, you have no sort of a, a real awareness of it and how you can kind of avoid things. I think on the how to ADU page, it's interesting to see, um, I was reading a post, um, earlier today that said, um, uh, my contractor abandoned me. It's been a disaster. Mm -hmm. And so they, and they were scammed and I'm like, oh my gosh. So you're working with a set of, you're working with contractors, subcontractors that you have been working with for a long time and that you, you know personally and that they're going to be able to get the job done. And, you know, we are always expanding our network of contractors. Sometimes homeowners come to us and they want to use their own contractor. They've already had a great experience. So we don't lock homeowners in. I mean, our particular model is not to lock homeowners into our contractor pool. Um, but the role historically of the architect is to become the client advocate during construction. We really try to bring on a team early and almost operate like a design build firm, but it's just two different firms, the design and the build. Uh, we just feel like that sets up the project to be a, a better end goal. We're all in this together. We all want to the same result. So let's, you know, not get to a point where you're trying to bid and you leave things out and you change order and you point fingers, right? So um, we do like to operate more as a team, but we're happy to play. We play well with others in terms of contractors. And, um, you know, it's for us, it's about finding like, what's the best fit for, right. for the customer. And they, you know, they say in construction, and I always argued this early in my career, but I've yielded to it now, but they say there's three things you can have in construction. You can have time, money, and quality, but you can only pick two. And I'm afraid that's true. So, you know, if you want to go fast, you're going to, you're either going to pay more or you're going to get a lower level of quality. Right. And so part of your architect's role is to advocate 
one, keep the project on track for what your goals are, what the two that you pick are to advocate for those, but also just, you know, you're going to build the right team based on those decisions, right? Um, who can go with this, who can deliver the schedule, who can make that all happen. So that, that's part of the role of the architect is to kind of champion those things and then become kind of the client advocate when things start moving forward. Right. And then it gets into the fun pieces. So, you know, after we do the design and the, and the permitting, like we get into all the um, material finishes. So these are just some examples. We put mood boards together for clients because we want to help them, you know, I'm sure a lot of people understand, like there is an overwhelming number of decisions involved yes. in building an ADU because you're building a whole house. It's not just like a bathroom with, you know, a couple accessories, it's everything. So what we try to do uh, is put together resources for our clients so they feel like they can make decisions, they know what they're doing and they can, we can get on the same page, you know, because sometimes you can do a questionnaire and say like, oh, what style do you like? And, you know, what quality um, do you want? But it's also subjective. So we find that by actually just putting pictures in there and then talking to clients about which ones they're attracted to and why we can help the process be a lot more fun and, and not overwhelming. You're not sending them to Home Depot and say, pick something out. Well, you know, some clients love that, you know, and that's again about, it's about building the team that's the right fit for you. So some clients could want nothing more than to go hunt for tile, right? And so what we can do is provide a finished schedule that says you need tile in these spots and this is about how much you need. Um, and then we help say your contractor put an allowance for X dollar, a linear foot or square foot of tile. And so then you make the decision if you want to go over or under. Um, I mean, some clients really love to do that and more power to them. And then they can, you know, feel like they're really more part of the process and other people, it's their worst nightmare. So we just try to find the balance and figure out how we can support people. Um, yeah, and I don't see any of those little nasty um, drawer pulls that are going to catch your pocket. <laughs> that's right. No, none of that going on here. But, you know, the I mean, the one thing I think that's important to talk about, too, is like, there is so, this is such a great industry. ADUs are so important to add more housing. And I, I do think it's really important to find who's the right fit for you. You need to find a team that's the right personality, the right fit you know, energetically, style-wise, like you should look at your designer architects. And I do want to just point out, you might have gone to architecture school and you can be a designer. You can only legally call yourself an architect if you've sat for the state licensing, but that doesn't mean that designers aren't qualified. So I just want to, they can be used together. Um, right. You, What you want to do with your designer or architect, which are both valid um, professionals, is you want to look at their work if you look at their work and everything is slightly, you know, if you don't like all this stuff, you want to find someone that has the same style because um, otherwise you're kind of pushing a rock uphill. They might have the technical skills, but if the aesthetics aren't going to match what you want in the end, um, you know, that doesn't always work. So you really want to find someone that you like their work and their style. And also you want to like their team and their personality. Um, yeah, that's a but good point, because it's basically reaching out, looking at websites, um, going, to, you know, to wherever they, they're posting their product mm -hmm. and the work that they have done. Um, sometimes I've seen some people that all that they have carry are just three dimensional images and there's no actually work that's been completed. They're just saying, I, here, I have all these cool designs. Right. And maybe they're just starting out and they have great designs and they just, you know, I think it, if you can find someone that fits your budget and they have experience, like I think that goes a long way in helping you with the process. I mean, ADUs are not rocket science. It's a, it's a small house, right? So it's, you know, most people are capable of designing and building. I think where there's more nuances where experience comes into play is about the permitting process. I mean, I work a lot with the code enforcement group at the Casita Coalition, and we are constantly turning in cities, you know, working with HCD, which is the governing body sure. of the state. Um, 
Because unfortunately, like we know a lot more than the planners that some cities do, and they're not interpreting laws right. And so if, if you don't know that and you don't have a team that has that experience, then when you go in to permit something and then you get a no back, you know, if your design team is not experienced, they might just go, oh, sorry, you know, we can't do it. Whereas, you know, we're then formulating a letter to HCD, we're arguing, you know, we're explaining to the planners how they've, you know, maybe misinterpreted the code. And so then we get that no to a yes, and then everybody gets their by right state you know, exempt ADU. So Can you talk about that a little bit more because the the Casita coalition, I think, is getting um, gaining some traction. I think in the space, um, yeah. and there's actually a presentation that you're going to be a, a panelist on tomorrow. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very busy person. So the Casita coalition advocating on the behalf of, let's say somebody who wants to have an ADU and has been submitted to a jurisdiction and that planner, like you just said, has said, no, you, that you can't do X, Y, or Z. And the Casita coalition, you as an advocate before it is going, oh no, no, we know the code and you can. So that's where you get that pushback. Right. And what's, what's happening at the state level and the, the poor state, you know, all these state laws, the new laws came out January 1, 2020, you know, and then three months later, COVID hit and the whole world went online and most planning and regulatory departments were not set up to be online. So I have a lot of compassion for both local and the state organizations. But and the other thing that happened is that everyone channeled their shelter in place angst into um, <laughs> their home renovation projects. So yes. like there's like never been such a building boom. So cities and the state are all backed up. But part of what our office does a lot of and the Casita as a larger grouper, we're tracking changes. So what HDD is doing is let's say one city has a violation, like a, they're not respecting the daylight plane or they're trying to enforce a daylight plane, which is a planning code that says how, you know, the volume of your roof line and where you can sit the building that shouldn't apply to ADUs, but they might only issue a letter to one particular municipality who was cited for not doing that. But then through the Casita coalition, they're spreading the word with the members saying, okay, you know, this municipality just got corrected that they can't enforce daylight plane, which means the whole state of California can't right. enforce daylight plane. So the state is not kind of distilling that information as a broad general bulletin. They're just dealing with individual. code issues, uh, individual code issues. That's right. And so part of the great thing that Casita is doing is they're kind of sharing a database with its members about these things. And when a correction comes along, you know, then you can start to say, oh, I, you know, I've got that in this other municipality. And then you can just kind of forward that information to the planners and see if you can streamline the process. And Calvo, if I'm saying that right, is I've attended several of their ADU presentations and I know that they're trying to get some information out there, but it seems very narrow in scope of what they're trying to get out there. You know, I don't actually know Calvo. So the California League of Building Officials, California League of Building Officials. Okay. So they, they do continuing education and they are for just planners. Hmm. And so they go and they get together and they talk, oh, hey, there's some there's new ADU laws and we, we got to be aware of them. Right. But until I was on with um, Greg Nicholas, with the, who was head up, headed up the HCD's Department of ADUs until he retired recently, bummer. So sad. Was, he was on a webinar and he and when Ryan uh, O'Connell was with us and daylight planes was mentioned and I'm like, what's a daylight plane? <laughs> and so like having you just kind of explain it, it's like, okay, how much of your ADU is going to be taking away the, the sunlight or blocking it? Is that, am I saying that right? Yeah. It's kind of like if this is your, if the wall of your ADU is within a certain distance of the property line, they kind of create this imaginary diagonal line, which they call the daylight plane. And the daylight plane is supposed to preserve, you know, it's a good practice in a lot of ways, but it helps, you know, preserve that you're not blocking out daylight for your neighbors and, and other, you know, it's a kind of a, a courtesy and, and maybe trying to entice people for better design that's more respectful of neighbors. But, um, technically it shouldn't apply to ADUs. Yes. Thank you. The The images you have here are fantastic. Oh, thanks. You know, I just wanted to like the attached one is a, a 
of the attached. The upper one is a detached ADU that we did in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just going back to like, how do you decide where to put your ADU? Like these guys have this monster building in the backyard. Um, you know, it's a nice church with a nice daycare and it's great. But if we had put the ADU on this left side, the nice green open space of their backyard, all they would have looked at from the ADU was the the big building. So one of the fun things with ADUs, I think, is that you can begin to start to control your what you're looking at from the main house. So from the main house deck, they can look down on the cottage, which I think turned out pretty well and is a, a nice looking cottage. And then it also helps, like when you're in the yard, you don't even see this building anymore because the the cottage blocks that um, that building. And then this lower one is a garage conversion. So um, this is the garage of this main house. And we were, they had enough side room to add a deck off the side. So we were able to focus the ADU on the side over here and give them an outdoor space. And then they have independent access through this side area. Um, but just, you know, not everybody understands right. the potential is of, of a garage. So, um, and then the other thing I just kind of just started to tap on earlier is, you know, what's really fun for me about ADUs is that every firm out there could build as many as they possibly could build. And we all still have plenty of work for everybody. So um, that just goes back to there's a lot of different personalities, a lot of different right. business models and a lot of types. And so I think it's most important for the customer, consumer to figure out, you know, what your values are, what's most important and who's the right fit. For you like Correct. one of our passions that we'll talk about a bit later is we try to make everything age in place so everything is accessible for people so you can see like the doors on this upper unit are flush so that right. if you needed to roll in from a wheelchair that that's totally accessible um same thing with this uh, garage conversion on the side so there's different kind of passions and expertise that certain people have and and part of building your team is to try to figure out what those goals are and, and who, what's important to you. And then, you know, surround yourself with people that know uh, are experts in it. Yeah. How to implement them. Yeah. Now when you say age in place, that's not necessarily being ADA compliant. So what I, I think is a gift is that um, single family residences and ADUs included are not required to be um, ADA. Uh, ADA the America's Disabilities Act uh, affects commercial buildings and multifamily housing, which is great because an ADA bathroom is gigantic and enormous and it takes up a ton of space. So what's so when you choose to do kind of more accessible or aging in place elements, um, you know, like this is a nice big open floor plan. Both of these um, have kitchens that line like the perimeter. So um and I, you know, I don't want to talk about this morbidly, but aging in place was really hard to get people to talk about. I mean, for us, it's about being proactive. And the reason it was important to me is that I had really bad spinal issues uh, for 10 years, starting in my 20s. And I may be a slightly strong-willed, stubborn person. And instead of healing, I would just fight my environment um, because I couldn't do everything by myself. And so part of aging in place is to keep people as independent as possible for as long as possible. Um, and that's just like, that's a pretty great thing. I mean, we had a client, we did an ADU for them that was all level and then they lived in the house upstairs. And unfortunately he got in a very, very serious bike accident and had a pretty long road of recovery. And if they didn't have that ADU downstairs, he would have had to be in a nursing home or a facility. Oh my. Yeah. But because they had a roll-in shower and everything was accessible, they were able just to move to the lower level of the house and and you know stay in their neighborhood and at home. So there's a lot of value to designing that way, whether it's just a temporary, whether you just throw your back out as a weekend warrior or whether you're, you know, actually develop something that keeps you from being mobile. And the other nice thing to think about, like we just redid our walkway at our house because whoever designed our house in the eighties decided that putting two steps everywhere was really fun. Um, but my mother-in-law is in a wheelchair now and she couldn't visit, you know, so yeah. she actually can't get in either of her kids' houses because of steps. So we were able to just redo our, our entry. Cause you have to think it's not just for the people living there. It's about who's visiting. 
And so it's just, I think in our mind, and we can, I have some more slides later about universal design, but it's just about better design, you know, and it's better for everybody. It's better if you have a stroller and you're trying to get, you know, the kids and the groceries in the house and there's no steps so much easier. Um, you know, it's easier to wash a dog that's been skunked in a curbless shower than it is <laughs> trying to wrestle them in a bathtub, you know? So <laughs> I think they're, they're just elements of design that are just, you know, are better. Agreed. And I think that's actually like an interesting segue. This is not a tiny house, but this is one of the smallest ADUs we did. And we, you know, the client really wanted the sleeping loft and you know, we tried to pop out this dormer and get some more head height. So, and I think tiny houses are super cool. They're really smart on how people take advantage of being clever about using space. Um, but I do think that for most people, they would have a period of time where they would be fun to live in. And then a period of time where they would no longer be fun. I mean, I'm 47. I don't want to climb up a loft to go to bed. Or try to climb down a ladder at three in the morning when you have to go to the bathroom. And no, yeah, so, same here. You, you, mentioned, really... you mentioned the uh, tiny home word. Um, if you could expand a little bit on your definition of how you see tiny homes, um, I personally have my own, and I'm not sure if I'm in the majority. Um, I doubt that I am. But tiny homes, you know, you, are you talking size or are you talking by? Park model, park model, camp cabins, or something that's on wheels? Typically, I would define the tiny home and the tiny home movement as something that's on wheels that can be moved around. Um, I We design small ADUs. Um, like this one is actually very tiny and it's very narrow. It was a garage conversion. Um, but I think the beauty of ADUs is that you have an opportunity to build new housing that's inclusive, right? And not all housing is inclusive. Like a lot of houses in the Berkeley Hills or the Oakland Hills, you know, have a ton of stairs to get up to the house. And so that's not going to work for everybody throughout their whole life. And so I think the tiny houses are interesting. I mean, it makes for great HGTV of people, you know, packing up their family and driving from location to location. I think, you know, that's awesome. Um, but I don't think it solves our housing crisis, and I don't think it really works towards adding that what they call middle housing um, to help more people have you know permanent spaces. Right, because tiny homes, um, by definition, are not by code are not for continuous habitation. That's right, and they are still viewed as chattel, which chattel. Uh, means personal property. It's it's a, a recreational vehicle codes mm-hmm. is what they're built to, and yeah, they they are small, um, and I think that some jurisdictions. I'd be very interested to see what the Casita Coalition would how they are embracing the fact that the city of Los Angeles has said yes, we're going to allow tiny homes to be you know as ADUs, and and I'm thinking to myself, you know, do there are a lot of companies that are jumping on the bandwagon of ADUs and they're producing tiny homes, but they're not being fully transparent about the fact that it is built to the RV code. And they are using the word modular, which by most people that are in the profession, modular is has been, not by term, definition, modular has been synonymous with a manufactured, something that's been built in a factory that was manufactured, but built to the CBC, the California Building Code, and compliant with the local jurisdictions codes that they may have. Um, so when they use the word modular and they're calling it their tiny home, I'm just like, oh my goodness, people are going to get so confused, Carrie. Well, it is complicated. I mean, we're just launching our modular, our modular units, and those are, you know, just built to the same code as if you're going to build in the vacuum. You know, it's distinguishing between manufactured, which is building to Title 25, which is a HUD, and it's a different level of building. It's a lower level of building code versus Title 24, which is what governs um, stick-built buildings in your backyard and modular prefab. And so I do think there's a lot of education around that. And I think, um, you know, part of it is getting homeowners to, you know, get that. And it's still, you know, it's still confusing to people. Modular 
prefab, panelized, okay. manufactured. Yes. Like, where is the line? And there, there is a clear line and that manufactured is on one side. And most of those other pieces I talked about are on the other. So yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, I know we just have a little bit more than 20 minutes left. I want you to finish the presentation because I, I wanted to get to, if we can, the rest of it and then talk about the aging in place. Um, sure. Because there are some things I really want to dive in on. Great. So I just, um, the way our office uh, addresses ADUs is we kind of have three buckets of how to help clients. So sometimes people either have just a very unique site, like let's say it's a hillside or it's steep or um, like this image on the, the, all these images are a, a garage conversion addition. So they're an existing footprint and then we were able to pop out and add on to it to get a larger ADU. If you have something on your site or you have a vision that you just want this amazing structure, um, you probably need a custom design. So your team will will need to be around that. Um, the other thing we've done to try to help, and we're not the only one doing pre-designed plans, but um, our model is that if you if we've done a building that works well for someone and we think that it could be repeatable and be used on a number of different sites, then we put that into what we call our plan catalog. So customers can kind of come through and find one that helps keep the cost down. It helps keeps the permitting time down. And it just, you know, we're all on a budget. And so we all really need to be, you know, figuring out how do you help your client achieve that? And if budget matters, then this is a good resource. So there are, you know, plans that you can buy online um, and different things like that. So we have, I think about 50 plants in our catalog now, and it's growing as the more custom we build, then we put the repeatable ones in there. And again, just to help clients save time and money and really not reinvent the wheel if if we have something that can help them. Uh, and then we are just launching our modular unit and we're doing modular a little differently than a lot of companies out there is that we have these three pieces and then you can put them together in different orientations uh, to work in your yard. So you, these are two examples of those different modules. The one on the right is an L shape where we turned the modular. So that way you can move the components around versus on the left, that's the long skinny bar. So based on the dimensions of your site, or if you're working around a heritage tree, um, you can kind of find a solution. And then we offer different roof lines so that you can try to, a lot of cities still have an architectural compatibility requirement that you can't go to yeah, planning they do you or, yeah, or any of those things, but you, you do have to sometimes comply. So by giving it different looks, then we're hoping we can help more people find something. But this is kind of just a little example of how our different configurations could go together. You know, we can just do kind of what we call the studio plus we can do these l shapes and just keep adding on the modules and on the right you know we can add on until we get to a two bedroom two bath so um, because the other truth is people have to realize most sites maybe only 30 percent are going to support modular right? right if you go out in your street and there's a major power line on your side of the road chances are you're not a candidate for modular because the crane has to come in, get under that power line, be 10 feet away, and the semi holding the modulars has to also get under that power line. Uh, and and then they set up in the front yard and then they lift it and set it over your house. So modular is really neat. It can really save a lot of time in your backyard and a fair amount of money, but it doesn't always um, work for people. So, it, you know, it can, it, from our findings, it's about 30% of the people have a lot that supports modular. Um, that's why we want to offer these pre-designed plans and, and traditional building um, to, to just help people figure out a way to get there. Right. Um, Cheyenne, if I, I hope I'm saying that correctly, had a question about shipping containers and are they considered modular? Um, my answer is going to be no, they are not. They are just a big metal box that can, does not conform to any code. Yeah, a pure shipping container is not going to get you a, a certificate, certificate of occupancy. You would have to come in, build walls inside of it, insulate them, add infrastructure, plumbing, a foundation. There's a couple of neat companies um, 
I think connect to homes. I don't know if they're still doing it or, um, but I believe they were using the container model and then you could kind of stack them up. I think there's some interesting people doing things with containers, but like, um, I always drive to our office up at Port of Oakland and you can see containers for sale. Like you need a company that's retrofitted it pretty substantially. Right. You need to retrofit it yourself to make it compliant. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Cheyenne, the, the, there are companies that are advertising that they have them and that they are really low priced. And I think that's why they're getting a lot of attention, but because they're not really complying to um, title 24 or title 25, you know, title 25 as Carrie mentioned is the HUD code. And then uh, Title 24 is going to be the local um, codes for the state of California. And the comments that I've heard with from people that have kind of investigated um, steel containers is that they're almost the same cost as if you just built it because of all the retrofitting that you have to do. So it's it's basically something that, that may have some really cool design elements and that if it's that's what attracts it to you, that is what... Um, you were attracted by, you know, then I would definitely say go for it. If it's an affordability issue, really dive into it to see if it does comply with the, the building codes that you need to have it comply to. Um, Tim had a question. It's like, what percentage of ADUs are modular? I don't know what the records would be. You'd have to have the certificate of occupancies that are going to be issued f for the jurisdictions, and they may have them. They might be able to get it on a title report, uh, Tim, but I have not seen that done but i would say that they're on the very they're on the low side of percentages of adus there's not that many of them currently the factories are the build let's say the hud product the title 25 are backed up so far that you couldn't get one built for a year or more two years um, there may be some companies that have more pull and they're they're bigger entities and may be able to get them more quickly but the other thing about manufactured homes built to the HUD code or Title 25 is you need to add, look at um, how it complies or how it conforms or works with your existing home. If you have two different styles of construction, Title 24, your main house, even though it was built 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago, and then you put in this Title 25, an appraiser is going to look at this and say, that's mixed types of constructions. So that... That might be an issue going forward with, you know, refinancing or sale when you go to sell it. So things you need to really kind of keep in mind. And again, which makes, you know, ADU, the marketplace, so confusing. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And the other thing, I just want to make a note on the containers. The shipping containers are really cool, but keep in mind, they're only, what, like eight feet wide. So coming up with a room and a bathroom and a hallway in eight feet, like it, it does, you know, it's... A, a fun design challenge, but it is a it is a design challenge in terms of figuring out how to get space. And what I've seen is when people have worked on container homes, they wind up stacking them all together and then cutting out all the interior walls. And so then virtually a majority of the container, I mean, one of the other things to do is just, you know, build an ADU and put corrugated metal on the outside if you kind of like that. Which, yeah, well, I, I think that those are really, really great. Now, this is an interesting shot that you have here. Everybody's reclining in the shower. Uh, that's a window seat. So one fun fact, a uh, good way to get a little extra square footage is that if you if you do a bump out, this is a more modern uh, window seat. It's not a bay window. It's what they call a bow, which is squared. And you can see it in the floor plan here. There's one in each bedroom. Uh, if it doesn't touch the ground or is a certain distance away from the grade, it doesn't count as square footage. So it's a fun, sneaky little way to get. Um, so we would have done modular uh you know, I've been building ADUs since 2007 and eight. And so um, my mom finally said, hey, you know, what about me? Because I've been trying to convince everybody to build them for their aging parents. Um, so we are building one at, in our yard. We would have loved to have modular, but our site, our, our street has one oak tree growing at like a 45 and you couldn't get the truck down the street. So, um, and then we're in a city that, is encouraging you to use, but um, as soon as you go over, you know, the state exemption is 800 square feet. Everybody has the right to build 800 square feet. Some cities are allowing you to go bigger. Um, right, to 1200. To 1200, 1100, different rules. But a lot of cities, as soon as you go over 801, will start to put in some different restrictions. Like, so the city we're in, for example, as soon as we go over 801, we have to go to a our full setbacks. So we no longer can take advantage of that four foot setback. And then the city can come in and say, 
you know, you're only exempt for those straight restrictions if, you know, floor area ratio, side and rear setbacks and height, right. if you stay under that 800 square feet. Now, mind you, a lot of cities are super friendly and they're not doing this, but our particular town is, so we were stuck at 800 square feet. So, um, but we've got a, a two bedroom, um, a big bathroom that's accessible with a curbless shower, little laundry center. And then we do have a half bath because I think you're only, you know, one stomach bug away from wishing you had more than one bathroom. Um, right. <laughs> and then open living room. So you can see that here, there's, there's going to be a kitchen. And then often we use these built-in banquettes because one, you get storage all throughout that bench. Um, and then also, you know, when you have furniture, you need to be able to walk around it. So if you have a table and two chairs, the design rule of thumb is that you need three feet from the back of the chair all the way around to be able to access things. That's just kind of a good design standard. And so by tucking these benches um, in and the, and the table into the bench, then we're able to save a lot of space. And then if someone is aging and they wind up needing to be in a wheelchair, you know, half of the table is accessible um, so they can come to it from that side. But yeah, this is uh, this is my mom here and her partner, Mary. So we are getting pretty close. Hopefully they'll move in in about a month. That is quick. I mean, that's yeah. close. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then just a little bit. So not everybody likes to talk about aging in place, but I do. there's also Let's do the it. <laughs> principles of universal design. And so this is, again, kind of just better design. The other really great thing that ADUs have the opportunity to do is that you can really design for someone particularly like our clients in this ADU. Um, she had what they call like a frozen shoulder and she couldn't reach up over a certain height. So these are these really nifty pull down shelves so that she could just grab this lower gray handle. Pull Carrie, everything I've never seen down. these before. This is the yeah, first time I've ever seen it. Yeah, there's a bunch of, I don't think I put the other this project is called Herzog and it's on our website. There's a couple other really nifty pull down things. Um, and what's it called again? Uh, this project is called Herzog. Uh, it's on our website. You can see it more, but it has some really cool. There's one for, for clothes hangers. I don't think, let me pick. Yeah, I didn't put it in there. Um, but there's neat things. The company that makes these is called Hefala. It's a Scandinavian company, but there's a lot of neat ways to like, do the storage to the ceiling, but then add some other elements in there to make it easier to reach. Um, and again, universal design is easier for people to talk to. I like to say it's a nice way of it's calling it aging in place because it's just as good for the grandkids that can't reach things up high as it is for seniors. So like you'll notice here, we've got the microwave down below. You know, it's not great for people who are having any sort of balance or mobility issues or dexterity problems to lift something hot and heavy over your head. Right. So um, putting putting appliances in an area that can be more easily reached. And again, that's by grandkids visiting just as much as it is an older adult. So there's kind of I won't go into it because I know we're eating up our time, but there's these different principles of just kind of making things equitable and easy to use. And so you know, how do we really just be mindful and be proactive? So, and, and I know. think that one of the things that I hadn't really known of is is how color comes into play with someone that gets older or has dementia or um, Alzheimer, all, Alzheimer's. And yeah. it, it's the fact that, again, you know, I, it's hard to put yourself in the position of somebody who is losing their cognitive, some of their cognitive uh, faculties, and that contrasting colors like let's say somebody and i could be wrong correct me or give me a better example like if you have a parent or somebody who's trying to who has alzheimer's and and wants to and will walk out the door right try to make sure the door is painted the same color as the walls hmm. so that they don't see you know that there's an opening that used to be there so that they kind of okay that i can't go out there that's the wall right yeah so there's we, a lot of interesting i mean getting into designing for dementia i think goes into like a much deeper right. that's a, that's another another interview another talk yeah but, so just another ask a pro webinar but, yeah but uh, there are a lot of really cool features you know like you might go see this aging parent and like notice that their countertops are really dirty and you're like why are you not cleaning anymore but one thing that happens is our eyes just deteriorate as right. we age and you often in older design aesthetics 
people would match their countertop to their floor. And what happens with our eyes is that you start to lose that depth perception. Um, and so one really simple thing that is an age in place design trait is have your countertops and your floor contrasting colors. Right. That immediately breaks up the two planes and helps your eye focus on either of whichever one you're engaging with. Also like natural light, making sure natural light is the very best thing for us as we age. LED lighting um, is, is the next best because you can do a nice color. color. Um, you get to pick the color of the LED lights to make it the right for your eyes. Um, the contrasting floors I mentioned, just keeping things within reach. You know, like we, one of our signature moves with our banquette is that we always have a drawer that opens out to the side. So you have to kind of customize the, the cabinet, but that way when you're sitting here, you can just literally reach down right. and access something um, and not have to, you know, bend down and, you know, you can kind of engage with your space a little bit differently. Um, and then the other just really interesting thing on aging in place is like, indoor air quality, like our buildings actually, buildings contribute a ton to environmental damage, um, but our bodies as we get older have less ability to handle toxins. So if you build a new building and there's a ton of off gassing, like what you might've been able to live with when you were 20 and what you're gonna live with when you're 60 is totally different. So you have to be a little bit more mindful of the quality of materials you're putting in and the off gassing and all of those pieces. And hopefully we're being mindful about that anyways, so that we're good to the planet. But that um, also goes, it brings in the title 24 because the requirements now is that the, the building codes make it so that everything is just so tight that it's very common. If I'm not sure if it's a, a code or a reach code where you have the air exchanger. Right. I know that we're getting one of those that's going to be, you know, p taking that stale old air that's on the inside and exchanging it with the outside air with the little crossovers that are going to be able to kind of bring that outside air to the temperature that's on the inside. Because if you didn't, they're so tight, you know, you, then all that off gassing really becomes more concentrated and it really could have some effect. That's absolutely right. I mean, there, that's probably another building technology um, webinar too, but there's, you know, we are building our buildings tighter and tighter, um, especially in fire zones. You know, if you're in a, a um, what they call a wooey zone, a woodland urban interface zone, you can't have your attic vented, right? So you can't, or you have to do it with, you know, fire rated venting, which is very expensive. So we are building these tighter buildings. So the more attention we pay to the materials we're putting in them, the, the better. Um, and I think that's all I've got for you guys. So that, that's, uh, okay. that's what, I've, what I've got. And I don't um, know if we, we talked too much. We didn't leave a lot of question time. <laughs> no, I, um, I think we got, uh, we answered a couple questions that are there, but um, if you could stop share um, uh -huh. on the screen, thank you for that, is is one of the things that I thought was fine, fa I find uh, really fascinating is that topic of aging in place, and I, and I really would like us to be able to do something, um, whether it's another Ask a Pro webinar, or if it's for AARP, because I know that they, they are huge, you know, huge advocates of ADUs and have been for years because it provides a way for somebody who's older to, to live in a smaller area, but they're not having to go into some sort of assisted living if they're lucky enough to have a family member where they can put an ADU on their property. Here's the best thing, the best plan. Um, if I, you know, if you have a senior who has a house, they want to stay in their neighborhood. They want to stay connected to their neighbors, their doctors, their everything they know but they don't wanna maintain the big house anymore and they don't need the big house anymore, then they build an ADU in the backyard for themselves. They move back into that. That's a new construction. You have the opportunity to make that totally age in place, kind of sculpt it for what they want. And then they can actually rent out the main house and have a revenue stream or an adult child and, and their kids move home and keep their property bases. Uh, there's a lot of win we're doing. That's kind of the people we help the most are the people that they have that maybe they have a lot of value in their house, but they don't have a lot of cash flow. And by building the ADU in the back, you know, they expense their expenses go down and then they have a actually generate income with the, with the main house. So the question I have, and this is again, probably a much longer topic just to discuss is how do they pay for it? I mean, if they don't have cash on hand, if they're retired, they might have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity. Yeah. 
Um, how do they pull one? Out? They can, you know, that group can typically qualify for that um, that Cal grant, the forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars of soft costs, and that can help pay for architectural permitting, getting everything ready. And then most of the most of the people, you know, in the Bay Area at least, house values have gone up so much since they've bought it. So they can yeah. take out a home equity line, build the ADU, and move into that. Um, you know, and some people are building the ADU and renting it out for until they're ready to move out of their house. Right. But, you know, a lot of people are excited to be in a brand new recently built house versus the house they've been in for 45 years. So, um, you know, the, typically the home equity line and the equity of the house will work out to make the math work out really well. And then yeah. if you don't have the house for your family member, um, you know, if, if families are pooling resources, that's one financial model. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the home equity line. And um, and then you rent out the house for actual income, which is like, then you're in a cash flow positive. You know, you're going to pay down the home equity line and you're going to make some money. Yeah, we were looking at um, initially um, renting out um, our ADU and we're in Burbank and, you know, we could rent it out for a, a lot of money. Um, but we're excited to have uh, my father-in-law move into it, who's 86. He's downsizing. And it's interesting how many people I, I'm talking to recently that are like, you know, mom and dad have this big, or mom or dad has this big house and they have this property. We're going to build an ADU in the back. We're going to move into it to, just because we don't want to continue to pay, you know, all the, the rent that we're paying. You know, we want to pay for, you know, the fact that we we want to improve the property you know, they're, they're talking to their kids, their, their siblings and the other family members, how they kind of balance everything out on an estate planning perspective. And I think that those things are really important. And, and um, I just like the idea. There's there's so many win-wins with an ADU with a family member that makes um, a ton of sense. Yeah. And Tim just had a great comment in the chat. I, you know, it is it would be great to have a financial webinar. I mean, working with an estate planner, I mean, one of the neat things, too, is that if you start to pool resources as family, then you begin to kind of, you, you do some legacy gifting and that if, you know, my mom's paying for part of her ADU, that, that money becomes a value to my property. Um, but I don't have any inheritance tax on that money as it's transferred. So, um, that, that would be another really great seminar to get no, that's a, a fantastic and seminar. a finance. Yeah, yeah no, I think that'd be fantastic. I, I would really like to do another one, Carrie, talking about it more really focused on aging in place. Um, I have reached out to AARP to see if they would want to have us do something for them on a regular basis, yeah. which I think would be fantastic. I think there's a lot of wonderful content that we can provide and that I think that they also have the formats to be able to kind of get a lot of the interaction to get the word out there. Because I think that's the most important thing is just in yes, Redwood Credit Union offering a new loan product. Well, yeah. also what what Ryan O'Connell mentioned is that um, the Cal HFA is maybe changing next month. Oh, really? What's that update? Some, that they will, like with Redwood, I think that they have, an, I'm going to get this wrong, but there's going to be some sort of bridge financing that somebody hmm. could then reach out, use the Cal the Cal HFA grant of 40000 to pay for those soft costs. There's a bridge loan that would, and this is the, is the exciting part, there would not be a requirement to refinance. Mm, right. So that you can keep right. your low interest rate if you have it, and they're going to, I think, they, they pretty much raise the the amount of the AMI that you have to qualify for, where I think in Napa, where Ryan shared, it was like something that was like 200000 which I think is brilliant, because you got to get the money to use with the people that can use it, and ra raising that floor of the AMI threshold, and then removing that refinancing, the requirement to refinance, because I thought that that was horribly restrictive, because, you know, we have an interest rate on our house it's under three percent and there's but we would i could probably qualify you know to get the forty thousand. Right. but those are other topics yes um, good idea tim <laughs> this is a very good one um and yes the redwood um, shout out by cheyenne is fantastic um so carrie I would love to do another one in the future with you yeah. aging in place financing do this do something on a whether you're it's just one-on-one -on -one or we have some panelists. Uh, you're very welcome, Tim. For everybody who's watching, um, 
if you have any questions for myself or for Carrie, wherever we have this posted, this recording, put some sort of a comment, put a question in there. We're going to do our very best to get back to you and answer your questions because this is the wild, wild west uh, in the marketplace right now where there's not a lot of guidelines. We want to try to be able to provide that information as best possible. Also, um, I cannot stress enough the importance of having somebody that looks at the construction the way that an architect does. So it's a really wonderful thing to be able to consider and I um, urge you to really look at that option. It is a little bit more expensive, but you do get what you pay for. So Carrie, any last thoughts? Um, well, I managed to not have any dogs bark and my husband <laughs> has only appeared sometimes in the back of the, so I feel like that was a win. And um, no, you know, there's a great, uh, the American Institute of Architects did a great commercial a few years ago where they had a guy on speakerphone and he was at a kitchen table with a scalpel and he's on with the doctor and he said, okay, just make a decision between your, you know, and the guy said, should I really be doing this by myself? And, uh, and, and the doctor said, well, no, you should probably hire a professional. And I thought like, that was one of the best things the AIA has done uh, in a long time. It's kind of really just try to explain, you know, we carry a lot of liability, we carry insurance, we've been spent a lot of time getting licensed and renew it every year. So, um, you know, there is value to that. Is it going to work for everybody? No, and it doesn't need to, you know, the more important thing is that we help people get housing and um, the ADUs are a great way to do it. So just find your right team. Uh, wonderful thing to end on. Carrie, thank you very much for all okay. of your time today. I know you're super yeah. busy and I will be tuning into the Casita Coalition um, webinar tomorrow at what time? Uh, <laughs> I have to log on early because of uh, because I'm a presenter. I think, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get in trouble for this. I think it's at 11. Yeah, it starts at 11 and you can go to the um, Casita Coalition. And someone asked, yeah, we, we are inspired ADUs and we're on Facebook and YouTube and, um, and Instagram and we don't tweet very often and I'm trying to become a TikTok star, but I'm not as good as David. So we're out there and you can find us. <laughs> yeah. Inspired ADU. They have a wonderful website and they have some really great, very inspirational design ideas. So definitely give them a, a look at. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you everybody Thank you, David. for watching yeah. with us live and for everybody who's watching the recording, you know. Let us know. Okay. Thanks. All right. You guys all Build take more care. ADUs. Yes, more ADUs. <laughs> okay, guys. Everybody take care. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.